Hi there, this is Denise, and this is the Activated Asana podcast, where we talk about all things having to do with yoga, teaching yoga, being students of yoga, and always trying to expand our understanding and our learning and trying to find new ways to help our students. So this is episode two of uh, our pain series, and Sarah is back with me, and we have more to talk about having to do with pain. Hey, Sarah. Denise, thanks for having me on again. <laughs> yeah, we're we're a pretty good tag team on this topic, I think. So yeah, we're and you know we love talking about topics like this. So um, this is this is sort of I think we're being slightly self indulgent, <laughs> but hopefully I mean, people are really interested and they're going to get some encouragement and some tools it, right? and stuff from us today too. Well, so that's our last. Yeah. Our last uh, podcast we did was was kind of just making you aware of what pain is and how it's evaluated in the brain and just kind of some things to consider so that we don't need to be afraid of it. And we'll reiterate a little bit of that as we go along. That's going to kind of be the basis of our understanding. And then today we're going to talk about um, some of the reasons why people have pain and then how do our habits affect whether or not we have pain. All right. So last time we talked about uh, this idea of being sensitive to pain or not. So we're going to start today with just talking about like, what are, are things that would increase somebody's sensitivity to pain stimulus? Well, I think we can, incorporate. this is a good spot again to highlight Greg Lehman's cup theory. Uh, I just, I really like his explanation. It's just so concise. And I like the visual of when your cup overflows that's when you're going to feel the pain, right? So some of the stuff in the cup can be like stress, movement habits, fatigue, malnourishment. And we covered some of that in, in episode one. But I think that what we as yoga teachers can really focus on is the movement habits and the strategies from that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have to stay within our scope of practice and, uh, our scope is movement, right? And teaching movement and encouraging people to move and making movement interesting and fun and potentially healing and strengthening and all of those things. So that is our era, area of expertise, if I may say so. Okay. So, you know, what are movement habits? Now, the thing to know about movement is that it, it quickly becomes subconscious. You know, we, we pick up a lot of our movement habits when we're very young and we're first learning how to move, you know, first learning how to walk and feed ourselves and get up and down stairs and, you know, get over obstacles and things like that. And, you know, believe it or not, when you're a toddler, you're not trying to optimize your position. <laughs> Now, you may do that by accident because, you know, humans are built to move. Well, you're going to all... do that. You're going to do that or else you're going to fail. Right. That's why the little kids, they try and get up and they fall. They try and get up and they fall because they're looking for the stability. And until they have it, they can't do the movement. Us as grownups have that overpowered triangle. Right. We have the power to do things that maybe we shouldn't be able we shouldn't to be, be, doing. <laughs> be doing but we can but we can overpower that anyway that's a whole other topic too but yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why I love watching kids move I do too I'm, I'm just absolutely fascinated and you know things like that children do uh automatically like for for me like getting right down to the bottom of the squat and just oh. sort of hanging out in the bottom of the squat like most adults can't do that and they don't even think that that's natural to humans, but it is. <laughs> yeah. The reason you can't do it is because you haven't been doing it. It's uh -huh. it's not because you haven't been stretching. Let's be clear. It's because you haven't been getting down into the bottom of the squat. That's so, right. you know, the, you know, our movements, like, like we don't think about our movement life a whole lot, unless you're like Sarah and me and, you know, you're into movement, right? And that's kind of your area of study and interest, but it's, for most people, it's just very subconscious, very habitual. And, you know, the thing is, you know, we'll figure out how to do something like climb over something. We're not optimizing our position. We're, we're very task oriented. We'll just get over it or get the job done. And that's good. We're not stopping to examine whether we could do it better unless you're doing something like uh, competitive sports or 
maybe dance or something, especially I find, um, you know, if there's an element of competition where you're, you're trying to do better and better and better for whatever reason, just improve your time or improve your prowess or something. And you're keeping track of that, you know, otherwise we're kind of oblivious to how we're moving. Even in yoga, people can be that way. You know, you can see movement patterns that they have in their life. Maybe their desk sitting posture, for instance, or their, you know, tech posture <laughs> they they bring it into class with them. And then, you know, you want them to be in a neutral spine or position or something or extending their spine. And they're, they're doing, you know, weird things <laughs> with their shoulder girdle or their neck or something. Aware. And they're not aware, right? They're uh, not aware. Somebody might they think, think they are having yeah, a neutral spine, exactly. right? Yeah. So, you know, again, we, we in yoga, uh, I mean, one of the, the things I know Sarah and I are trying to do is just make people more aware, like to just really inhabit their body throughout the practice. So they know exactly where they are. We're building our proprioception. We're building our interoception and we know where we are in space. So that, that is, that is again, not the kind of experience that most people are having unless they're practicing yoga that way. And, you know, like I said, you know, people will figure out a way to do something and they'll just keep doing it that way. They won't optimize it. And let me give you an example of like somebody who's newer to yoga and they're doing like a uh, chaturanga say in mm -hmm. sun salutations, maybe never done sun, uh, chaturanga before or an action like that. Maybe they've done push-ups before, but a lot of people, you know, that come to yoga are not necessarily athletic. So they may not have had experience with something like that. And then that is the exact kind of posture where you'll, you might try to get that job done, but you won't really know how to organize and activate that position mm -hmm. if you're new to it. And if well, the teacher the body, isn't specifically telling you. That's right. And the body will always, will always try and answer the call. It will always try and do its best for you in mm -hmm. whatever way right and even in in the functional movement system world um we say it's kind of like water right like the body will try and get it done the quickest way possible or, and as efficient as possible and if that's through a poor mechanical habit that you have perpetuated whether that's from being like this at the computer or sitting for a long time or sitting on the couch or just having poor technique habits, your body's going to go for that because that's the most efficient way it knows. So the more time we take to, um, to practice well, those are going to be the go-to postures for our body, right? So it's how yeah. you're training as well. Well, yeah. And, you know, often, usually, uh, if you show a student a better, more stable, more efficient position, the body recognizes it. Oh, and and then, that. you know, you start to mm -hmm. practice that the body is then in a position at first on your way right to unconscious competence, which yeah. is where we're trying to get on the way there. You know, you're consciously choosing okay, I, I just learned this new habit, this new way of doing this better. Uh, it feels better. It doesn't hurt my shoulder now. And, you know, so I'm going to choose to do it that way. And then you keep choosing to do it that way. And eventually it's the way it's your default, right? We want to have better default habits that we don't have to think about so much because we've developed that pathway and repeated it enough times. Yeah. So that's what a, what a habit is. Now we're talking about developing good habits, but you know, it's just as easy and probably easier to develop poor habits. And, you know, some sometimes, you know, you'll have poor habits in your body and there will be no obvious consequence to it. But oftentimes, if you have a poor movement habit, it means that like one side of a joint is going to get constantly irritated. The muscles and tissues on one side of a joint will be like kind of outpace the other side in terms of strength and, um, you know, just pliability and all the qualities of tissue of uh, muscle and connective tissue, you're going to have imbalances that the, now the joint has to deal with. So it can e easily and frequently, I would say most of the time, cause some kind of issue down the road. And a lot of people think that that's wear and tear <laughs> on the human body. And it's only wear and tear because you, you know, you're constantly using a poor position. That's right. Because otherwise, like wear and tear is healthy stimulus 
for the human body. But when you're sort of out of alignment, we'll say, I'm not a super big fan of the word alignment, but you know, if you're kind of uh, have these compensation patterns in your body that uh, take you out of your joint centration. So where the joint isn't really seated properly so that it moves on those smooth sliding surfaces really well, mm -hmm. then, you know, you're going to get irritation on one side of the joint starts to break down the tissue, you know, and you are starting to have a chronic issue. For sure. And sometimes, you know, sometimes, like you said, in our last episode, pain can be very late to show up. <laughs> so sometimes, you know, with a chronic issue like that, like you don't get pain until there's been a significant amount of tissue degeneration. Now, I'm not saying that to scare you. I'm just saying like, that's the importance of developing good habits. That's right. You know, that's all. And the sooner you can be conscious, you know, of your habits, the sooner you can make these perhaps little adjustments or, or improvements. And like we said last time too, the yoga practice can really serve to illuminate some of that, you know, because we do things on one side of the body, then the other. So you can compare how each side feels, you know, we take the body in all kinds of different directions. So that really shows you what's going on in your body and, and your body I will start from, to communicate. And then I think from there, people can then take it in a wrong direction, right? So then they're focusing on, on wrong things in the practice. So then maybe they're going to be stretching, whereas the body doesn't need more stretching, it needs strengthening, but, but people don't know, or yoga teachers don't know, um, that then they're doing too much too soon, because they just want to hurry up and fix it. And then that causes overloading of the tissue of the joints. And then there's lack of preparation, right? So if we use chaturanga, like, that's a very complex pose that if you're not making really thin, purposeful slices of that, you know, and there's something to be said about yoga classes, like going with the flow and all that kind of stuff. But if you're really looking to change a position and change tissue, it needs to be done in a certain way um, over a period of time, right? Because tissues change at different ways or at different, it takes different timings to change different things, right? Central nervous system is going to change really quickly. Muscles and tendons and tissues, not so quickly, right? It's on the other end of the spectrum. Then there's that whole of, uh, there's no methodology to it, right? So even though yoga, and it can be still a flowing class with a purposeful plan to take your clients or take your students from doing a really good eccentric push up, right? Load, loading that shoulder in a good way in a bunch of different ways, like you said, to then inviting them to try full chaturanga and see how that goes. I bet you you're going to see much different results than if you just spring it on them. Oh, absolutely. Like this, I, I know, like for me, I'm just so into building foundations in the practice. This, this idea of, of preparation, like this is where you have the experience. Like you could be working for weeks on different shoulder strengthening uh, postures and positions. And then, you know, after weeks of that, doing something like Chaturanga or doing something like crane pose, and you will have built up the tissue strength, the proprioception, you know, uh, hand to core connection, you know, for weeks ahead, they don't, they, your students may not know where this is all leading. They're, they're just doing their practice. Right. But you as a teacher, I like, well, I'm preparing them for this, you know, and we're going to, now we're going to try this because we prepared the tissue. Like you say, it's, mm -hmm. you know, it only works to spring things on students if they've had years of preparation. <laughs> and once you have, then yeah, you can try all kinds of things, but, but to do that without preparation. And like, like you said, you know, you have to prepare the proprioception, right? The, the nervous system aspect, then you prepare the muscular aspect for control and coordination and strength. And then you, then you have to prepare the connective tissues and most injuries are connective tissue injuries. Mm -hmm. And it is the tissue that takes the longest to get stronger and adapt. So, you know, we have to give it time. There, there's just no other way to do it. So, you know, encouraging a consistent practice over the long term. And it doesn't also happen. It's not a one and done process either. I can't mm -hmm. tell, I can't tell you how many times I've, <laughs> I've done that in my own self, <laughs> in my own practice, you know, and not just yoga, like 
when I first started doing CrossFit, you know, like I didn't start doing kipping pull-ups, you know, I started doing <laughs> jumping pull-ups and I totally sucked at them. Right. And then you work, you work your way up to that. And then maybe you, I, I've had a few injuries, you know, just it happens when you use your body a lot. And so then I've, started from the start and built up again and even even when I started taking your classes uh I did I was a pretty fit person but I was always used to doing the military push-up which is quite different than the yogi push-up and I remember you really slicing it thin for chaturanga and I remember feeling really good success when after weeks in class working on it and feeling really good and strong and then boom, there's my chatter on it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, that, that is just the, the process. And I, I, again, I, I just want yoga teachers to understand that, you know, at that adaptation over time, you just have to load incrementally and take it, you know, over weeks. This is, if we're talking about connective tissue, which these tendons <laughs> You know, yeah. uh, that people always ir irritate in Chaturanga. Those need to be built over time. And you're not necessarily going to build it with Chaturanga, right? No. Like a modification of Chaturanga maybe, For but sure. but uh, there are a number of ways, right, that we can do that. So, I mean, ultimately, we're looking at, at creating habits that are going to keep you out of pain. That's basically what we've been talking about so far is keeping you out of pain. So let's look at um, what kind of pain we usually do see in yoga. Okay. So we kind of, we're telling you how to avoid pain <laughs> with better habits, with a movement strategy, with incremental challenges. Now let's see, like, what do we normally see uh, in yoga? So they probably acute on chronic or chronic would be the, the big one. So acute pain is really instant like you just did something like something just just tweaked or pinched or something and in yoga it's usually something internal that's that's happening in the body would, would you agree with that oh yeah well we don't usually run into each other <laughs> so but you know somebody <laughs> could fall out of a pose though yeah true you know and and definitely um yeah yoga teachers be careful because if there is like something acute Oftentimes, I want to just give this caveat obvious. Uh, oftentimes, there has been something chronic going on. There's been something brewing for a while. And then, you know, you as a yoga teacher come along and give an assist in just the wrong position. And now you could have an acute on chronic issue, like Sarah mentioned. And then there would be like an instantaneous, oh no, <laughs> or there would be a pop or something. And you know, the thing is, students will often not say anything. Mm. I mean, you know, <laughs> anybody ever do that? You know, students will often not say anything. I had my neck really severely hurt uh, by a teacher trying to help me to, to do this like backward roll uh, oh. directly along my spine. And, you know, my neck wasn't having it. <laughs> so and I, I was I was hurt from that for several weeks. And fortunately, I knew things to do for myself to, to kind of move through it. But, you know, mm -hmm. people t get torn labrums, they get, um, they'll tear part of the hamstring tendon off the sitting bone. So we, we do see their shoulder injuries and stuff like that. So, you know, that is, unfortunately, you know, the nature of, of these sort of chronic things that people have going on, you're just not going to see that they don't feel it too much when they're warmed up. And now the teacher comes along and pushes them somewhere too far. And now that tissue is actually quite weak there. Uh, and now there's an acute injury. Now, I'm not always saying that sometimes a student, you know, is going to injure them themselves. No, you know, that too. But I'm just cautioning you as a yoga teacher that you're just not going to know what's going on in somebody's body. So if you yeah, are you assisting, feel that's more common in yoga, like then rather than fitness, because I, I know in my career, I've, I've rarely done hands on stuff. I've always coached with my voice or, 
given suggestions or tools like straps or blocks or even in the fitness world, right? So would you say that's more yoga? Yeah, I would say that did come from stuff. kind of the, 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 you know, Krishnamacharya tradition, you know, and the uh, teachers that brought yoga to the West, Batabi Joyce and Iyengar and Bikram and Desikachar. So, you know, those teachers did a lot of hands-on assisting, a lot. And that was, you know, again, that was accepted <laughs> as yeah. part of the culture and all of that. And, you know, I think I, my thought is now, I think there's, it's not used quite as much. I think certain like Ashtanga will usually use that hands-on assisting a, a lot more. I personally am a, also a massage therapist, so I'm quite comfortable using my hands, mm -hmm. but I, I don't, I'm not massaging my students, right? I usually, I might give them a hand to push into, oh, yeah. to, to create stability or again, to show them like them how the activation, yeah. the direction and activation is, is supposed to take them in yes. so that they can feel that themselves. Like, right. I don't want to do anything that they can do for themselves. Right. I That's, usually use I, my foot. I like put my little <laughs> put my toe on their <laughs> under their belly if they're like to get that tactile sense. Right. Yeah. Foot. Yeah. Yeah. But never to push anybody no, never, anywhere no. at all. I'm I'm never interested in doing that. So and those so I like I think this idea of chronic pain though is very, very important because it, it can lead to a certain kind of injury. Yes. Uh, and again, it's not always teach yoga teachers. I don't mean to say yoga teachers are injuring students. No, students no. have their own movement habits, right? And mm -hmm. they can look just fine from the outside, but there's other factors in their life, you know, that contribute to irritation of that joint. And, you know, now they have something chronic going on. And um, again, with these chronic injuries, you usually feel okay when the body's warmed up. And so you, you keep exploiting that tissue and then eventually it will be pain that stops you right it's just adding insult to the injury right yes that's that's why that term is there that's what that term means adding insult to injury there actually is an injury brewing and then you insult it to enough of a degree that now you're going to have pain and again so we're back to that place where where you were saying sarah like pain shows up late there's, you know, especially like a, a more of an acute pain, it shows up late. If you're there, there's been some damage happening. Well, and then there's the acute, uh, that really leads us nicely to acute on chronic, right? So you could mm -hmm. still have that pain brewing in the background. It's, it's, it's fine. It's okay. And then all of a sudden it's not okay. Mm -hmm. And now you have a, that flare up that needs to be taken care of because now it is, um, impeding your movement you're not functioning as you should you've got the wonky like you have stuff. to compensate <laughs> you have to compensate thank you that's a better word than mm -hmm. wonky. but yeah like so there's just kind of those three main pains and then with the chronic mm -hmm. pain there's the there's the gradual onset injuries right like like we alluded to before yoga is not the full contact sport that all of a sudden it you're going to get tackled and your knee is going to go bend the other way. You're not going to fall into a hole and sprain your ankle. Like, so the gradual onset injuries is going to come on slowly. Um, it's going to brew for a long time. Exact, exactly what you just said. So if, if we're aware of that in our yoga practice, then we can do things to, to kind of change things up to add variety so that we can lessen that. Yeah, I mean, that's a great term. Like variety is is just so important because it means like if there's lots of variety in your practice, it means that you're kind of building relative rest into the practice so yeah. that it's not the same structures getting challenged in the same way all the time, right? And mm -hmm. so you can practice three, four, five times a week or whatever you want, but if you're just changing things up so that no one area is getting overly stressed all the time. That's right. So that's, that's, you know, again, we're, we're giving you some problem solving here. That That's a really good one right there. Mm -hmm. um, now, you know, if you're trying to teach students new skills, then you need some kind of consistency and like slow building. We're not, we're not, we don't want to not do that, but we just don't want, you know, a lot of yoga 
uh, systems will do like the same postures every single class. I don't think that's a great idea because as I said, you're going to keep stressing the exact same structures all the time. And, you know, that can lead to a gradual onset injury just because there isn't a good balance between stress and rest. And you're definitely going to be leaving out parts of the body that need to be strengthened so that there's balance, you know? Well, I think with that as well, with the repetitive um, movements, <clears throat> if the technique isn't spot on, if oh, there's yes. some, if there's some movement already that you're, that you're compensating with, and it could be subconscious, you know, um, that's going to add to that, like by a lot. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Hmm. So let's, let's just, uh, kind of look at what pain is trying to tell us. So we, we, looked at um, last episode, we were like, it's a request for change. You know, that's one thing we could say about it. It's information. But assuming that it is information, mm -hmm. something is being irritated, insulted, misused, or weak. That's right. So the, something that's what's going on in the tissue, in the tissue, not in the brain, but in the tissue. Yeah. Okay. And the other thing to know is when there's pain, uh, especially when there's an inflammatory response, healing is trying to happen. Your body is trying to heal. So again, we, we have to try not to think of pain as like necessarily a bad thing. Just kind of stay neutral about it and just say, what does it mean? And what, <laughs> what does, does that need? point toward? It needs yeah. some support. It needs yeah. your body is requesting a change or something. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and it could be requesting rest or it could be requesting you need some loading here. It could be requesting better body mechanics or a change in body mechanics, like yeah. stop doing that repetitive thing all the time. So, you know, it's a request for change and it could indicate the need for rest. Now, as the more like it moves toward acute, the more it, it indicates like something's more broken, like parts of fibers of a tendon might have been broken or you might have a muscle tear or something you know going on in the joint but more like acute it feels so the the more suddenly it happened or like again that straw that breaks the cam camel's back there's usually like if it's like a happens in a moment there usually is a little bit of a degree of tissue damage there could be a big degree but there could also be just a little bit Okay. So again, depends on how sensitive you are to the pain, but it's going to be a request for change. So you've got to stop and just look at it, feel it, try to figure out, you know, what the root cause is. And well, and I think in our next episode, that's what we're going to be yeah. discussing is how to then, what do you do? Like, what do you do? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like one thing I like, I always want to sort of speak out about is this idea that if you have like aches and pains uh, due to movement when you're an older adult, it doesn't mean that, you know, you're wearing out your joints or something, no. <laughs> you know, and it's not just about aging. It's about, you know, are my movements good? Am I doing adequate movement? Am I, am I balancing my movement? Am I balancing stress and rest? You know, it's, it's about that. You know, it doesn't matter. Like if you're, even if your body is older, sure, you're going to get some tissue changes. You're going to be more dehydrated, et cetera. But movement is the thing that hydrates your tissue. Movement is the thing that's going to maintain your health and wellness and vitality. You don't want to stop doing movement, but sometimes it's going to be uncomfortable. So you want to just, you know, look at, you know, what am I doing that could be causing discomfort? Can I do this a different way so I can keep moving, et cetera, right? And, well, I think you know, movement, it doesn't just have to be in the movement class. You know, we have, also have to look outside yeah. of the movement class. So even though maybe you're a yogi or maybe you are teaching many classes a day, what else are you doing with your body? That is also movement. It's also movement. So uh, mm -hmm. that's a, something to consider as well. But I agree. In terms of, of uh, stressors. Yeah. 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 And could be affecting whether or not you would have pain or not. So remember, we have to go back to saying, yeah, it's not just about the tissue. It's also about what else is going on in your life. And the are those, thing. is your life like <clears throat> supporting you? What are your, you know, your coping mechanisms, et cetera. For sure. So I, I did want to sort of um, just, again, for yoga teachers, I just want to mention some of the 
things that you would see that are typical, very, very typical gradual onset issues. Okay. Things that, you know, kind of are chronic pain issues that come on, take a long time to, to come on and start to interfere with your function and stuff. But these are very common. So things like carpal tunnel from keyboarding. Uh, everybody knows somebody who's had carpal tunnel or struggled with carpal tunnel, right? That, that doesn't happen overnight, guys, okay? It takes a long time to develop carpal tunnel. And if, again, if it's caught early, you can change something about that. Maybe, you know, some people just have jobs that are going to be just extremely stressful to the carpal tunnel. And the, and sometimes you can't do that much about it. But yeah, definitely typing, keyboarding, texting, all of those things can contribute. Even, even like, um, like florists will <laughs> develop carpal tunnel from, you know, uh, the way they use their tools. Hairstylists. Yeah. Things that are, are super repetitive. Also thoracic outlet syndrome, right? You know, that's going to affect the neck and the shoulder complex and maybe even the pec and, and usually like affects the entire arm because these are nerves that are being compressed, et cetera. Uh, like hairstylists will often have that, or sometimes you see that with uh, people who paint, you know, mm -hmm. like house painters and stuff. So again, those things don't happen overnight. It takes a long, long time for them to build up and really start to cause problems. And they'll be ignored, right? Like a hairstylist, you know, it takes them years to develop their technique and everything. And to interrupt that because your shoulder, your arm's a bit achy, you're going to need more incentive than that. That's then, you know, the nervous system will shut that down if yeah. it decides that's I have one of those too much. in my class right now. She she is a house painter, actually. And mm. uh, class just started up again, right? Um, just last week. It was her first class. And so, right, she's been in my class for a decade. So I know her issues and whatever we've chatted. I've tried to help. And here she is doing overhead movements. And I was like, oh, wow. Like, what happened to you? Like, that's great. I said, are you sure you don't need any modifications for that today? And she's like... No, she's like, I feel great. I was like, well, good. Well, what changed? She took the summer off. She had oh, so yeah. <laughs> she had rest. And I was like, oh yeah. She's like, but I start work again. So she knows that's why, because we've chatted. She's I've referred her to people and we know it's why this hurts and why overhead movements aren't are painful sometimes for her. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And you know. I guess she could look at her painting technique. Maybe she should use a sprayer. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe you'd still get or that with many it. options. Yeah. Uh, okay. People often, you know, uh, runners will often get plantar fasciitis or, um, well, there's, we won't go into all the different things that can happen oh. with running. There's so many, but that is, that is a typical one. Um, high hamstring tendinopathy. We see a lot of yogis with that. <clears throat> Um, especially if they do a lot of forward folding and they're like very, you know, competitive at it, <laughs> competitive forward folding, that is a problem. Um, and, you know, it's just so many of them. Like, I, I don't know why we do so many forward folds in yoga. And by we, I just mean in general, I wouldn't say I do a ton of forward folding in my class. Um, my, my class would do it actively much more than like a seated forward fold. <clears throat> Oftentimes, like we, people think these passive stretching postures are totally innocuous. They're, they don't cause injury, but they do weaken the tissue. And over time that can, you know, start to just erode the strength is how I think about it. Like you're not building strength. You're, you're, you're losing it over time. And then it leaves you more vulnerable to uh, injury. Also like biceps tendinopathy, this is the chaturanga thing, you know, right. off and stretch, uh, stress, this biceps tendon that comes across the front of the shoulder. So again, this is like improper chaturanga technique or trying to force it too soon, or, you know, just not having, um, that balance between stress and rest that you need for, for good adaptation response. And then things like hip labral tears. Uh, so that can be like getting pushed into a forward fold of some kind, um, hanging out in deep lunges where you're kind of hanging down on the, on the joint, on the front of the joint. 
Um, things like that are, yeah, they're pretty aggressive on those tissues. And something like a hip labrum is kind of all connected in with the hip joint capsule and all the tendinous structures and everything around the joint. But the labrum itself, even though it has a few fibers in it, is more like a cartilage type of material. And it's just doesn't handle being tensioned all that well. So, or being like pinched, it doesn't like being pinched either. So, you know, either way, like getting pinched into a forward fold between the bony edges or getting kind of stretched open in a, in a lunge, neither of those are good for that tissue. So this is kind of why I advocate for fascial tensioning, which is much more external to the joint over joints to support the joints and not like damage the internal structures of the well, joints. I'm not saying that that any of these moves that you're mentioning are like <clears throat> red flag moves or you should never do them, but it's, let's think of them maybe as a uh, spice, right? You don't want to add too much, a uh, too much spice because it's going to wreck, wreck your food. Yeah. Like you need some actual food too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and the actual food for me would be, you know, standing postures, balancing postures, you know, full at the bottom of the squat kind of thing, like things that are like, going to ensure that you can walk, you know, as an older adult and that you're, you know, your body, you're maintaining your body wide function and stuff like sure. that. So lots we can do in yoga to ensure that kind of outcome. Absolutely. Okay. So let's just quickly do a little rundown. We're going to talk more about this next time, but um, what's a yoga teacher to do, right? Somebody comes up, Oh, a friend of my shoulders really hurting. Um, what do you tell them when they're experiencing some kind of discomfort? Because they may go right into fear, right? Just, oh, like, does this mean like I can't practice yoga? Am I doing something wrong? Am I, is this just not for me? You know, people can go there. So first thing you always want to do is remind your students that their body is always trying to heal. This is information. Let's look at it. Uh, look at what it means, but there's, you want to bring them out of fear and into curiosity, into Absolutely. let's investigate. It's fine. We can modify for a while, you know, and we'll talk about more strategies. You, you have to teacher, change something. That's right. And you as a teacher, um, even though people might not think about it, they're looking to you for some answers, right? That's why they've come to ask or, and so you actually do have, um, they're looking at you with some authority, right? You have some authority to to change that in them, even with that little sentence of, oh, well, let's take a look at that or let's explore that more. So even with your language, you could be changing them just with those few words. Sarah, we don't realize how powerful we are in that Very respect. Good. Like the way we respond to a student concern can make all the difference to them because they're coming to us because they trust us. And if we can give them some reassurance and encouragement, that will go a long way. Because again, we, we sometimes don't know why people heal, mm -hmm. but you know, sometimes people are literally going to heal because somebody listened to them. That's right. Even Did if you, you know, like they've done studies on, yeah. on people who, as soon as they book a doctor's appointment, they feel better because they've taken an action. So That's them right. coming to you to say, I'm concerned about this, you know, can you help me understand what's going on? Or I'm worried about this, you, you know, immediately you have an opportunity to interrupt that kind of fear cycle and mm -hmm. assure them. And even yeah. if you're, even if you can't fix it, you can walk alongside them, ask for updates, all that kind of stuff. And just that will help support. Yeah. That's, that's us humans. You know, we need that. Uh, other thing, like, again, just plain strategy is using organization and activation to find a better position and a modification of their position that will reduce the pain, right? So just change a little bit of something about how they're doing it. It doesn't mean that they have to like, like go back to square one or something. Quite likely, there's just a little modification that would probably help them quite a bit. They'll learn something from doing it. And they'll be able to keep practicing, which will actually ultimately help them heal. We always work on stability and strength, right? In activated asana, it's stability first. So you, you can be, if somebody is dealing with a chronic issue, you can always work on their stability. And we often do this with isometrics. So we'll, we'll talk more about isometrics uh, next time. Very, I mean, most asana practices are full of isometrics, 
yeah, we just hold them for a little bit longer and, and then they become even more therapeutic. So we can do that next time. Um, and we don't want to like focus on perfecting their movement. You know, it's about making movement feel better. <laughs> you know, where, where they feel stronger within themselves and they feel like, okay, I can do this. You know, that's empowerment. That's what we want to do. That's our role. I think, you know, our role as teachers is not, not making everybody aesthetically perfect. It's like, does this feel good? Do you feel like you have control of this movement? Is it doable? Like, yeah. And even, and even at like, literally verbalizing those words in class you're going to create an internal dialogue in that person right I'm not looking for an answer when I'm asking those questions from people although you might get some some back you're looking for them to go oh yeah I don't know I never thought about that oh yeah I I wonder where I feel that so that's what you're you're cueing for yeah oh yeah I mean yeah, that's that's probably another show is just talking about like the effect of cueing and oh. the messaging that you're you're delivering throughout the practice. But, you know, suffice it to say that in this pain discussion, you know, it's all about reducing fear. It's about empowering. It's about, you know, just really the helping them believe that their body is trying to help them. It's going to heal that, you know, they're naturally designed to heal. There's nothing about them that's like unique or unable to heal okay we we just need to keep and i mean your students need to hear it all the time like i say because they're get, hearing different messages outside of your class all right so that i think kind of covers what we wanted to talk about today um <clears throat> oh one more thing though i did want to say that we also want to give our students permission to rest too <laughs> so throughout my classes, I, you know, yes, I'm challenging my students, but I'm, my aim is for them to know their body well enough to know when they need to take a step back and take a rest, because uh, I'm sure you've had this experience, Sarah. I know I've had it many times that sometimes you feel like you're done, but then if you take a step back and you just rest for a little bit, you bounce back much quicker than you think. So mm -hmm. having that experience, you know, multiple times throughout a practice, if you need, you know, just so that you see that there's, you know, you're not kind of, it, you don't have so much inertia that if you get fatigued, you're never not going to be fatigued, <laughs> you know, like you just need to take some breaths. And I think, like you said, uh, the variety can be rest as well. It yes. Doesn't, it doesn't have to be just Oh, I'm going to rest now. Like it can be, it can be variety. Yeah. Just, and as teachers, just building in active rest throughout the practice so that, yeah, they're doing something that's maybe calls for a lot more attention and, and um, effort. And then you move on to something that's much more gentle or has a totally different focus. I like think one of my favorite rests of yours is, uh, is, uh, I like your technique of breaking it up with some pranayama that I love that. Me too. I love that too. <laughs> I, yeah, that ha I've, has really become an integral part of my practice. So um, the way I teach and, and I guess I, I do that for myself as well, but it, it is a good, so a vigorous pranayama practice, Oh, but I it's, love it's the, such the a totally pranayama. different. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's so it's such a totally different emphasis. It's a bit of a challenge for the breath, yes. but it's a, a rest for the rest of the body. So it's just kind of a, yeah, it's kind of that active rest idea. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So, you know, be, be creative as a yoga teacher. You never have to, um, movement is so essential that you want to find new ways to move that are more comfortable, that do feel like a relative rest and, you know, but keep your students moving, keep them encouraged, keep them empowered and constantly giving them that message. Uh, and they need to hear that from you. Where else are they going to get it? Let's be real, you know? At your yoga class. Yes, that's our role. All right. So thank you so much for being here, uh, Sarah, and uh, 
having giving me somebody to discuss this with and your knowledge and uh, contributions are so appreciated and super important. Well, thank you um, for having me on, Denise. It's yeah. always a pleasure to, to chat about this stuff, not just like an hour after class, but like maybe we can have discussions with other people as well too, like in the chat. Yeah, yeah. I'd love to hear what other people have had experience with here. But for now, we'll we'll end it there and we will uh, come back with a third episode, which will really be loaded with some really practical things that um, you can use to address the concerns of your students. All right. Thanks so much for being here and bye for now, everyone.